Okay, so let's uh, do a little training on the new California Purchase Agreement. This is the one that came out in December of 2021. Um, don't want to make it complicated. Uh, I just want to start off by saying, you know, the Purchase Agreement, in my opinion, really needs to be uh, like the, your best friend in the real estate transaction because everything about the real estate transaction is written in the Purchase Agreement. So, uh, you know, any disputes or disagreements or miscommunications with agents on the other side, the answers can be found in the purchase agreement. So real quick, the first page, just like before, you're going to be making an offer from a party here on a property located with the parcel number, right? And then you're going to have your um, agency disclosure, who's the selling broker's firm is, who's the buyer's broker's firm is, those, that information goes in here. And then the biggest uh, difference is going to be what is called the grid now. And everything in the grid, and the grid is going to be on pages one, two, and three, everything in the grid is located in paragraph number three. So you can see the three here. This is three A, B, C, D, D1, D2, E1, E2, E3. So as you go down through the grid, Everything is in paragraph three, and as you're reading the body of the text throughout the RPA, it will refer back to, when it refers back to the grid, it will refer back to paragraph three something rather. Also, the second column in the grid is, is kind of like a reverse um, reference. If you want to know informa more information about the initial deposit, you'll find it in paragraph 5A1. If you want to know more information about occupancy type, you'll find it in paragraph 7a. So it makes it really easy for you to go find out in the where in the RPA the language is that supports this term or this part of the contract. So just as with before, real simple to fill out. Essentially what they're doing now is taking everything that we've known in our old purchase agreement and they're pulling it up to the first three pages and putting it in the grid, making it really easy to find, really easy to reference. If anybody's ever done the summary of multiple offers page, it's kind of set up like that as well, where the key points of each offer are side by side. Uh, this is kind of the way, the same way they pulled it up, same format. Purchase price, whether it's all cash, close of escrow, so you can go days after acceptance or a specific date. Expiration of offer, instead of being on the last signature page, is up front now. It defaults as three calendar days, or you can choose a date, and it defaults at 5 p.m. unless you want to choose a, choose a different time. Your, EM, your EMD, your earnest money deposit, or initial deposit amount, will go here. When you put that dollar amount in here, it will auto-populate a percentage of the purchase price. If you have a, a listing agent that wants you to use 1% or 2%, and you put the number in, it will tell you what your percentage of your EMD to the purchase price is. Defaults with three business days to get that um, in. And it also defaults as a wire transfer. So if you want to do it as a personal check, you're going to need to write it in there. Um, we usually do not uh, do increased deposits. Uh, in our, so if, unless you're doing an increased deposit, you would probably skip over this section, but if you were, you would put that in here as well, and then whether you're going to be removing contingencies at that time. Loan amount, your first goes here, and again, it's going to put a percentage of the purchase price, so it actually puts your LTV, right, your loan to value in here. So if you have a $500,000 purchase price, and you're doing a conventional 20% down and you put 400,000 as the loan amount, this number should be 80%. Or if you're trying to calculate an FHA and you put the purchase price and you have your loan amount, right, which is 3.5% down on FHA, so your loan amount is 100 minus 3.5, which is 96.5, this number should be 96.5%. Otherwise, you've made a calculation error and you need to, you need to fix that. The loans will default as conventional unless you check your FHA, your VA. Um, I uh, wanted to just highlight this section here. Uh, we've had some issues with people writing offers and they're checking the all cash box. 
but they really have a private lender or a hard money loan. So it's not technically cash because there still has to be some kind of approval process to get that money. It's not their money. It was not in their uh, you know, a savings account or their checking account. So that's where you would hit this other, put in private lender, hard money, or if you're using a different loan type that's not listed here, you would use other uh, there as well. Additional financed amount, again, you're probably not doing that very often where you have two uh, loans, right? So back in the day, there was a lot of 80-20-0 loans. Those were people that were going out and getting a first at 80% loan to value, a second at 20% uh, loan to value, and then they were using zero of their own money down. That was some of the creative financing uh, when you were doing like zero equity type purchases. Then your occupancy type, primary, secondary investment. And then what's really cool is if you've done everything correctly, your purchase price, your EMD in your loan, it will pull up the balance of your down payment because it has a formula in here and your purchase price total should equal each other top and bottom here. Okay, so that's page one of the RPA. Okay, so moving on to page two. Uh, this is now an area where you can put a seller credit to the buyer. So you would put the amount of uh, seller credit that you'd want to ask for in the contract here. And it, it is defaults to be applied to closing costs. Again, it's really cool because when you put the amount in here, it will populate a percentage. Uh, so it's a little different than when we used to write them before where you would say seller to uh, contribute up to 3% of the purchase price. You actually have to put the dollar amount in there now and it will calculate it so you'll know if you get that 3% number uh, or not here. Uh, so that's that section. Additional finance terms, that's an area where I would maybe use like escalation clauses uh, or possibly um, you know, the buyer committing a certain amount towards a short appraisal, appraisal gap coverage. I would put that in that section right there. Then our verification of cash, if it's an all cash purchase, or if, if you need to show them the verification that you have the money for the down payment and the closing costs, three days default, and then here, the loan application, you also have three days to um, let them know that you've gone out and filled out an application for a loan, unless you want to already attach a pre-qual, a pre-approval, or a fully underwritten pre-approval, then you would check these boxes over here. Uh, moving on to final verification, right, that's going to be your, your uh, VP. Five days prior to close escrow, you're going back in to check for repairs and making sure the house is still in the same condition it was at the time of, of the uh, acceptance of the offer. Uh, and then a new one here that's caused a lot of confusion, this assignment request 17 days after acceptance. And we'll talk about the assignment request as we get to that in, in greater detail. Um, then all of your big contingencies are pulled up in all up to the grid here in one spot. So they're really easy to find. Your loan is at 17 days. Your appraisal is at 17 days. So the loan used to be 21. So that got a little, a little faster. Your investigation of your property, 17 days. The review of the seller docs, 17 days. Preliminary title report is up front here. Now easy to see 17 days. Common interest disclosures. So, uh, you know, those are going to be your HOA type docs, right? Anywhere where there's a common interest. Uh, so like amenities and homeowners associations right there. Uh, review of leased or leaned items is here. And then also the COP, the sale of the buyer's property contingency is exists right here as well. You just check the box and it will auto populate the COP form. Um, over here on the right side, if you want to remove the loan or appraisal going into uh, the offer, you would check those boxes here. A little reminder that if you have a, a, a loan type that requires the FVAC, so those are going to be your FHA and VAs, that removing the appraisal contingency here does not eliminate the appraisal cancellation rights that are written within the FVAC. Uh, so just be aware. Also letting you know that you can remove any of these contingencies by using a CR attached, but it also does give us a nice little language here that says, if you remove or waive any of these at the time the offer is made, you're doing so against the advice of the agent. Okay, so that's also really, really key. 
A little further down on page two, and we'll talk about this a little more uh, as we get into this a little further, but time of possession, wait for the train. There we go, got a love to hatch me. So time of possession is at the time of notice of recordation, right? So that's when we get notified by escrow that it has, uh, you know, uh, closed, that they've stamped it down at the recorder's office, right, that it's recorded. So now possession changes when we get notification, unless you want to make it at 6 p.m. or pick any time or pick any date specified, which would be applicable in paragraph 3M2, which is the next one down, which is the seller occupied, where you're going to attach a form SIP, seller in possession, and you're going to make the change of time with the change of possession uh, based on a date later than the close of escrow. Okay, so we'll talk about this, and that's why I have it highlighted. We're going to talk about it more later on. Uh, really important things to talk about when it comes to the differences in the uh, transfer of possession and the change of ownership. Okay, uh, if you have tenant occupied units, then it talks about the tenant occupied property addendum that would be here uh, and then moving further down we're just going to start talking about some of the things that the seller has to do these are the seller timelines delivery of documents reports disclosures material facts seven days uh, signing and returning to escrow holders provisions and instructions for both sides five days after receipt of them and then time to uh, pay the fees for ordering HOA docs. So the seller's got to get the fees over to the HOA uh, company three days after acceptance to get that process started. This one we'll talk about later as well. Install smoke alarms, CO detectors, and the water heater bracing. The seller has seven days to get it ready to go, and this is to help make sure the house is ready for the appraiser, and we're not having to deal with uh, re-inspections on that. And then evidence of representative authority again this is kind of like the old rcsd the rcsd is is kind of becoming obsolete now as we sh will show later on when we get to the signature pages the rcsd is now built into the rpa uh, but you would have to show three days after acceptance you, what your role is if you are the trustee of a trust or the man managing member of an llc or the owner ceo of a corporation or if you have power of attorney or any of the other rcsd um, representative capacity situations. So that's the end of page two. Now moving on to page three. Uh, so before when we talked about what would be included with the home, it was basically just refrigerators, washer, dryers, uh, right, and uh, stoves. Now it's, it's grown a lot more as uh, the argument over what items are actually attached as fixtures to the home as that debate has waged on and we're getting some more clarification with technology. We have things like video doorbells and security systems, and security cameras and smart home control devices. So those things to mark. Uh, it used to be, if you guys remember, a flat screen TV that was mounted to the wall like this one. The TV was personal property, but the mount because it was attached to the house was considered a fixture. Now you actually have to check the box if you want the brackets or the wall mounts okay because now those are now those can be removed and taken like like personal property so, so we have uh dishwashers microwaves uh wine refrigerators are in there now so take a look at this section these are all the things that you want to add uh, into the contract for personal property type things you would add additional items here if you wanted to add more things and then exclude would be here just like before. So just be aware of the different items that are up here. The next section, which is section Q. So we're still in paragraph three, but now we're in paragraph three Q, and this is the allocation of costs. So this is how we determine who's gonna pay for what and whether or not we're gonna ask for those certain reports to be done by any specific um, providers or any particular companies. So your NHD, right, is up here at the top. Pretty simple. If you want the environmental, you check the box here. You can put your provided by company right over here. 
This is where we probably do your pest report, maybe your roof inspection, maybe a sewer line uh, camera scope or your septic and who's going to pay and maybe who's going to do that report if you don't want it to be a uh, seller's choice. Uh, smoke alarms, CO detectors, water heater bracing, you can choose for the seller or the buyer to pay or both or however you want to do it. If you have any uh, point of sale, correct, you know, corrective things, say you have a house that's in a city where the city's going to come and check to see if their compliance is up to date, if there's a compliance report against the house and they're going to stop the sale of the house until that comp uh, the house is back into compliance, you can put who's going to pay for that, you know, seller, buyer, however you want to do it. Escrow fees, owner's title insurance policy, you get to pick the escrow holder and you put the title company in here only if the title company is different than the escrow holder. One thing we've seen so far is people that are putting in the es big long escrow uh, company's name and then the escrow officer's name because it's too big for this space, it's creating a text overflow addendum. So just be aware of that. It creates an extra page where it just has just that information in there. Uh, let's see, buyer's lender, lender, buyer's lender title insurance policy, excuse me, it defaults as the buyer. Uh, you would have to agree otherwise if, you, if the buyer wasn't gonna pay for it, but pretty standard most uh, transactions, the buyer pays the buyer's lenders, uh, buyer's lender title insurance policy. County, city, transfer taxes, HOA, uh, prep fees, seller default there, uh, HOA transfer fees, private transfer fees, and then if you want to put in some other ones here, if you need more space, there they are for fees or costs there. And then your home warranty plan, you put your cost over here, who's going to pay for it, and you can pick your company over here. This line spacing here is the type of home warranty plan, maybe you want to make sure it's like an upgraded plan or something of that sort. Other terms, if you need space, there you go. That is page three. Moving on to page four now, we have all of your addenda. And those are all going to be up in this section here. One thing that CAR wanted to do was to create one purchase agreement. So now when you're doing a manufactured home, instead of doing that on a separate purchase agreement, you're still using this form. But now you're checking this box for the manufactured home purchase addenda addendum and it will pop it out, it will populate it and you can fill that out. So everything is kind of done that way now. Probate, uh, purchase agreement addendum is here. And then these addendum here for your short sale, uh, you know, your court confirmation, uh, if you, uh, addendum is here. If you're doing a SWPI, septic bowl property monument and propane addendum here. Remember this houses that are on propane, you should have one of these. Uh, so that you can figure out your propane issues and not fight about them uh, as you're closing escrow, which seems to happen quite a lot. Uh, if you're in backup position, there's your backup offer addendum or any other addendum that you want to add, add it here. If you're writing an offer and you want to add something like that, you need to make sure that your addendum is train, <laughs> that your addendum is attached to your RPA. You have to make sure that anything that you want as a condition of your offer is attached to the offer. Otherwise, technically, they could respond to the offer and not to the addendum, if that makes sense. So make sure you attach it here by checking the box and putting the number in. Uh, also, if you have a 1031 situation, intent to exchange for both buyer and or for the seller. So those are your intent to exchange um, forms there. Advisories, like we've always had in the past. Of course, we're all familiar with the statewide buyer and sellers. There it is there. If you're on a short sale, trust advisory, REO, a probate advisory. These other ones are already pre-checked because those are the ones that precede the uh, between the agency disclosure and the actual purchase contract. So those are these four here, or sorry, the uh, two of them, the wire fraud, right? And the uh, fair housing one and then the California Consumer Privacy, Consumer Privacy Act and the Buyer Inspection Advisory, of course, are after the RPA, but still attached. Okay. Uh, if uh, all the wildfire disaster advisor, please take a look at that one and read that one. We see that come across a lot in offers because the people, the agent believes that because it's in a high fire area that they need to put that advisory there, but reviewing that advisory, you'll find that's for 
homes that exist in an area that was just ravaged by wire, wildfire, and it talks about the toxicity that might be in the soil uh, from things burning or uh, from things falling out of airplanes, right? Fosjec, fire retardant, things like that. So it talks about um, the possibility for pollution in the area because it was in a wildfire zone. So read that one and get to know it. Okay, moving on, we start talking about the bones of the offer. This is uh, all the language. So we're talking about our initial deposit, increased deposit, retention of deposit, cash offers, loan, your first loan, additional finance loan. So, you know, stuff that we've all seen before. There are some items that, as we go through this, I've already highlighted to kind of talk about. Um, so the first one, I'm not going to talk about every single one of them. It's something that I probably read and went, oh, this looks pretty cool. We should talk about it. We'll talk about limits on the credits to the buyer. If you remember earlier up in the contract, we showed you where you could write the, the uh, seller credit. And so what this lets you know is that if the seller credit amount that's on the contract, so the contractual amount is higher than what the lender can actually use, then the contractual amount on the contract will come down to the amount that the lender can use, right? So on the contract it's here, but the lender can only use this much. This will drop down contractually and we will not, there will be no automatic adjustments to the purchase price to make up the difference between the contractual credit and the lender allowable credit. So be aware of that here. Nice to know, no arguments over credits. Uh, and so that's pretty much it for page four of the RPA. So moving on to page five, a lot more to talk about here. Condition of the property uh, on closing. So if anybody who's been around me he knows how much I used to love paragraph 11 on the old purchase contract. This is essentially my new paragraph 11. So now 7B1. 7B1 is going to be my favorite paragraph. Unless otherwise agreed, the property shall be delivered in as delivered as is in its present physical condition as of the date of acceptance. So what does that as is mean? Okay, so you've got a buyer that comes to you and says, hey, I sold my house down in San Diego and I had to pay for everything uh, to get it closed. They made me, you know, they gave me this big report and I had to fix everything. So don't these people up here uh, have to fix all of their stuff before I buy their house? The answer is no, the house is being sold as is. Uh, when people write on a, a contract, you know, we're going to give you $500,000 cash, 21 day escrow, as is. It's like, yeah, no joke. It's always as is. Every house is sold as is, unless you otherwise agree. And there are a couple of different ways to otherwise agree. Otherwise agreed can be how you write your offer. So if you're putting on your offer, you have a pest report and you want the, the uh, seller to pay for section one clearance of any termite or uh, dry rot findings, then you've agreed that the house is being sold as is and with those fixes, right? So that's how those, that's how you write stuff in to kind of override that as is a little bit. Also, when you're done with all your investigations, you can create a request for repairs, form RR. And if they agree to them, then it is otherwise agreed. So it's as is, except for what you agree on, right? So the house is delivered in as is condition. There you go. As of the date of acceptance, whatever condition the house was in at that time. Okay, that's sentence one. Sentence two, the property, including pool, spa, landscaping, and grounds, is to be maintained in substantially the same condition as on the date of acceptance. Substantially, not exactly, but substantially, not kind of, substantially. Whatever that means, right? That's uh, up for, for debate, but it means it should be pretty much the same uh, you know, uh, substantially the same, sorry, I, I kind of contradicted myself there, uh, as it was when you accepted the offer. So the pool, if it was blue and clear, must be blue and clear when you come, when you take over ownership or possession, excuse me, of the house. Uh, it can't be green, it can't have frogs living in it and tadpoles and stuff. The spa, same thing, right? It's got to be in same condition. You, if it was usable, then it's got to be usable now. Landscaping and grounds, you got to keep watering your plants, keep watering your grass, you know, trees can't die, grass can't die, 
so also the condition, other things maintained, like if the door to the bathroom didn't have a hole in it, it shouldn't have a hole in it now. Same with the walls. They shouldn't be changing doorknobs. Uh, they shouldn't be changing fixtures, right? You had really nice uh, you know, brass fixtures in the bathroom, and now you come in and they're cheap, uh, low-grade, brushed uh, nickel or something like that. So same condition as of the date of acceptance. Okay, sentence number three. All debris and personal property not included in the sale shall be uh, removed by the close of escrow or at the, at the time possession is delivered to the buyer, if not at the same date. Okay, so a couple of things here. First, debris and personal property not included with the sale shall be removed. So, debris is just like tr rubbish, trash, junk, stuff, out, personal property, furniture, uh, barbecues, uh, things like that all need to be removed. Uh, debris can be things like, uh, say you jackhammered out a patio and there's a pile of concrete in the backyard. That needs to be removed. You pull down an old chain link fence and roll it up in the corner of the backyard. That needs to be removed. Okay, now it says either by the close of escrow or at the time possession is delivered to the buyer. So what is the difference between those two? Well, the close of escrow is the time at which ownership transfers from one party to another. The delivery of possession is when you actually take possession of that property. How can those two things be different? Well, as we saw earlier, you're, you're going to get the... Um, so you can have it where they happen at the exact same time. So at the time of recordation, unless it's otherwise written, that you're going to do it differently. When the county stamps that deed and everything transfers, you get possession and ownership at the same time. Now, what about if you have them in till 6 o'clock in the evening that day, but you record at 11 o'clock in the morning, right? Well, then your ownership transfers at 11 o'clock in the morning, but your possession doesn't transfer until 6 p.m. Or if you have a seller in possession, for a day or three days or a week or two weeks, right? Anything 29 days or less. Then you have change of ownership at the time escrow closes, but transfer of possession up to those 29 days afterwards. So that's really important to remember. They're two different things. And people will get that confused. They'll say, hey, I own the house. I should be able to go over there and, you know, go in, take a look around, move my stuff in. No, the people are still there if you've given them permission to be there. So you don't have possession quite yet. Okay, here's where it gets even more fun. If items are not removed when possession is delivered to the buyer, not ownership, not the close of escrow, but possession, if those items are not removed, the item shall be deemed abandoned. We'll come back to this, it's really important. The buyer, after first delivering to seller, Written notice to remove the items within three days may pay to have such items removed or disposed of and may bring legal action as per this agreement to receive reasonable costs from the seller. So, the items that weren't removed by the time possession is delivered are abandoned. Now, what happens if the new buyer coming in wants those items? Does he have to give written notice? No, he does not. They are deemed abandoned at the time the buyer takes possession, they are his. So if he wants them, they're his. That's it, plain and simple. If he doesn't want them, then, and he wants them off the property, then he has to give a three-day written notice to allow the seller to come back and get them. If the seller doesn't come back and get them within the three days, then he can move forward with the process of having somebody remove them for him and get him out of there and then go back, excuse me, go back and try to get, recoup his money from the seller, you know, in a, with a legal action of some sort. So, a lot to unpack in that little paragraph right there. Okay, other spot where there's some great language to help protect us. The buyer is strongly advised to conduct investigations of the entire property in order to determine its present condition. Sellers and agents may not be aware, be aware of all defects affecting the property 
or other factors that the buyer considers important. Property improvements may not be built according to code, in compliance with current law, or have had all the required permits issued and or finalized. Big sentence right there. I like that one. Protects us a little bit, right? We, uh, it kind of lets the, uh, the buyer know that the, uh, the buyer still has the responsibility uh, to take care of that stuff. Okay, so here we go with more of the, ch the difference in possession versus close of escrow. If there is a seller in possession SIP form signed, then the parties are advised, so I like this part again, right? Because they always ask you, well, what's my legal, what, what does that mean? What rights do I have? And we should not be trying to tell our clients, either buyers or sellers, what their rights are in an SIP because we aren't the insurance companies, we aren't the, the loan people, we, you know, we're not the, the mortgage folks, um, we're not attorneys, so we shouldn't be giving advice. So it clearly states right here, the parties are advised to consult with their insurance and their legal advisors for information about liability and damage or injury to persons and all personal and real property. Uh, buyers advise to consult with the buyer's lender about the impact of the seller's occupancy on the buyer's loan. What does that mean? Well, like a lot of lenders will say, you, it, you, you have to be moving the house within a certain period of time, or they're going to start looking at it as an investment property, and that wasn't the kind of loan you got, right? You got one for a primary residence. That's even bigger with like FHA. So you'll see there's reasons why the SIP is 29 days or less. Uh, because once you go to 30 days or more, it's no longer a seller in possession. Now you have a tenant and you have a tenant landlord relationship and there's tenant laws and tenant rules and things that totally change. So you never want your SIP to be for more than 29 days unless you're planning on going into a lease situation. Okay, so that's what this is talking about here. So that's how it can affect um, the buyer's loan. And also to consult with the qualified California real estate attorney where the property is located to determine the ongoing rights and responsibilities for both buyer and seller with regard to each other, including possible tenant rights and what type of written agreement to use to document the relationship between parties. Okay, so that's what we're talking about right there. Right, that's really super high level stuff that you don't want to just, you don't want to get into as an agent. Okay, <clears throat> so another one. Seller shall on the close of escrow unless otherwise agreed. And even if the seller remains in possession, really, really key right there, provide keys, passwords, codes, and means to operate all the locks, mailboxes, security systems, alarms, home automation systems, intranet, internet connected devices, including included in the purchase price, garage door openers, and all items included uh, in the preceding paragraphs, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, access to the homeowners association, amenities, facilities, so on and so forth. So. Even if the seller is staying in possession, they still must deliver all these things. Even though that does not give the new buyer the right to enter the home, right, with the seller still in possession, but they still have to be able to have all the items that belong to them now. Uh, so like, you know, a garage door opener or house keys, copies of house keys and things, security systems and alarm codes and so on and so forth have to be delivered. To the buyer now if you read the sip the seller in possession it's very clear about when a buyer when a buyer can come into the home and the seller is in, in still in possession of first if there were any repairs that the two sides agreed needed to be done then the the, the new buyer can come in with the contractor to get those repairs fixed if the new buyer has uh, a talk to the uh, the old seller it says hey look i want to bring somebody in the measure for blinds can we set an appointment yeah sure no problem you can come on in, measure for blinds. Uh, if there's an emergency, you can enter the home. It's got to be an emergency, though. But you can't just come by and come in the house and be like, oh, it's my house. I thought I'd sit on your couch and watch TV and wait for you to get home. You can't do that kind of stuff. Okay. So, uh, with that said, uh, for the most part, let's see. I don't know if I wanted to talk about this one or not. Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, too, and it'll be in the page five. On the appraisal, it's really important to note and to have these conversations with your buyer. If you're writing uh, offers with no appraisal contingency, which we're seeing a lot of in this competitive market, uh, so if you mark that box, then the buyer may not use the loan contingency 
to cancel this agreement if the sole reason for not obtaining the loan is that the appraisal that's relied upon by the buyer's lender uh, values the property at amount less than specified in paragraph 3L2. If the buyer is unable to obtain the loan specified solely for this reason, the seller may be entire, entitled to the buyer's deposit. So basically it's saying you can't just write an offer with no uh, appraisal contingency hoping to get out of it uh, because the lender won't be able to satisfy the loan on the appraisal. If you could still qualify for the loan, but now you just don't have the money to cover it, and you went in with no appraisal contingency, your buyer could be losing his EMD. That makes sense, all right? So again, have these conversations with your buyers before you're writing these, these wild offers. And that is the end of, of page five. Okay, moving over to page six, uh, the one I just wanted to talk about was just right here in this area where we talk about uh, the removal of contingencies with your offer, right? When you're waiving them, when you're writing the offer. And we read uh, a little earlier in here that it's against the advice of the agent, right? So let's, let's kind of jump into that a little more. The buyer shall have no obligation to remove a contractual contingency unless the seller has provided all required documents, reports, disclosures, and information pertaining to that contingency. So that's like basic in, in the contract, right? We have, uh, they have seven days to provide us with those reports. We have to review those reports. And as we approach that contingency, if there's some reports that haven't been delivered yet, we can send them a notice to perform, reminding them that they need to get us some stuff. If they send us stuff late, we have five days to review those things, right? We don't want to get rid of those contingencies until we've, we've reviewed everything and we feel comfortable moving forward. But what happens if a buyer does remove a contingency uh, when they're writing the offer? So it says here, if the buyer does remove it without first receiving all the required information from the seller, then the buyer is relinquishing any contractual rights that apply to that contingency. So if you write an offer, with your inspection contingency waived, you don't have any rights if the house is junk, right? You can't say, oh, I'm getting out because of the condition of the home. No, you already removed them. So if a buyer removes or waives any contingency without an adequate understanding of the property's condition or the buyer's ability to purchase, right? That's loan contingencies. Uh, buyer is acting against the advice of the agent. So don't do it if you really don't have to. I know that there's a lot of really um, competitive stuff out there, but come up with other creative ways or make sure that you're talking to your client very clearly about what they could be giving up, okay? So that's, uh, and then here's a, a little more on removal. We'll just talk about this section real quick and we'll move on. But a buyer, if a buyer does not remove a contingency within the specified time, the seller, after first giving the buyer a notice to perform, shall have the right to cancel this agreement. So, how does this work? So, you're coming up on the end of your 17 days of your inspection contingency, and if you haven't removed it yet, it just will continue in perpetuity. It just moves forward, that, that contingency. And even though it's you know appropriate for the buyer to remove it, when, if they've gotten all the information gathered and moved forward, it, the way that the, it, it works in California, it's uh, contingencies are actively removed. They're not passively removed, meaning that when the 17 days comes and goes, the, the contingency doesn't evaporate and passively remove itself. It has to be actively removed by that person, typically, who has to enforce the contract, which is going to be the seller. So the seller sends the contingency removal form, right? over to the buyer to remove the contingencies. And if they want to enforce it, they enforce it with the notice to the buyer to perform, which gives the buyer 48 hours to get rid of that contingency. If they don't remove it within the 48 hours, then it, it puts the seller in the position to be able to cancel the contract because the buyer is now in, in breach of contract. Now, that does not mean that the EMD automatically goes to the seller. If the contingency was still in place at the time that the, can the contract is canceled, then the buyer has uh, a, a you know, contingency in place and thus can, can get his money back. So 
We can talk a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get deeper into this, but that's just kind of briefly touching on that for now. And that, for this point, is all we really need to talk about here on page six. The rest of this was leased and leaned items down here, in, and then uh, items included in the sale. We talked about a lot of that already up above in that big grid, and uh, we had some the reviewing of the leased or lean items and condominium plan unit development uh, disclosures and title, a preliminary title and title insurance and such. The preliminary title report was all in this area. So um, page six, not much to talk about. 